Good evening, everybody. Uh, congratulations on such successful careers and um, really excellent speeches today. Um, this question's for you, Dan. You had a slide up there about the difference between the physician and scientist paradigms. And I'm just wondering, what are the tips and techniques you use to flip between the two on a day-to-day -day or weekly basis, however you're managing your workload? Yeah, I mean, we're not really taught the science model in our medical schools or our allied health or our nursing schools. I had to sort of learn it the hard way um, through um, uh, failure and success and, and listening to mentors. I think, um, and being a diagnostic pathologist is another thing altogether we haven't even talked about today. You have to be, you have to be um, honest to what hat you're wearing at the time. So for example, I might see a patient and I, I, I secretly know that I have something that probably could help them or cure them when I'm seeing them as a doctor, but it would be unethical for me to take that and put it into their vein because it hasn't yet passed preclinical um, GMP tox. So I have to be honest and remember what hat I'm wearing at the particular time. Um, at Stanford, it's even more complex where many of these guys have started companies based on the incredible things they've discovered. But they are not allowed to take, they're not allowed to receive money from the company for the very thing they've discovered. They have to leave it to someone else, but they have to make sure they don't use what they learn from the company to change their research practice within the university. So you have to be honest with yourself and keep the right hat on at the right time. Other questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for talking today. Um, I'm a junior doctor myself, so I suppose this question's um, for all of you on the stage, but um, you've presented many um, options for pursuing uh, opportunities such as audits and courses and masters and programs. As a junior doctor, um, hoping to get into research and basic science, are there opportunities to become involved in basic science prior to advanced training? Um, and I suppose more lab-based research opportunities. Okay, maybe, and then Peter can, um, yes, yes there are. Um, some of the, we don't boast much in South Australia, but some of the best basic research per capita is actually done right here in South Australia. I cannot believe the research output from, from the basic scientists that we have here and clinician scientists. Um, but we don't make very, hopefully from the sessions like this, we don't form very good bridges. We used to have excellent bridges in the old hospital because all of the pathology and the science was done on the same campus. Um, and I'm pretty confident we are beginning to build far better bridges between scientists uh, and clinicians. My final comment is, um, most, of the, uh, most of the really successful physician scientists that, I've, uh, that have inspired me in my life, they did basic first. It's actually really hard to run a, design a really effective clinical trial for say a new therapy, unless you know the, the detail of pipetting, and bench work, and, and I think there's, if, if you've got, if you're slightly keen on doing some sort of basic training as a PhD, just like Peter did and I did, I would never look back. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, what the women's and children's, there are certainly um, specialty groups doing laboratory work. I mean, we have a laboratory, you know, connected to the work that we're doing and welcome anybody that's interested. So we have medical students come and do some time with us. We have undergrads come and do some time. Um, we have um, trainees. Um, and I think it's, um, it's working out how much you want to do. Um, you know, how much of the basic science do you want to do? How much of the clinical work do you want to do? Because if you don't, if you do a bit and then you, you decide maybe the laboratory work's not for you, you'll always find someone that wants to, would like to collaborate with you. It's the scientists and the clinician collaboration that's really important. So you don't have to do everything. There'll be other people that want to come and work with you because you're passionate about what you want to do. So find what you're passionate about, what you're interested in, 
and go and knock on the door of that lab is what I would say. It's a great question, uh, your question. So we, we certainly uh, are trying to adopt a, a model whereby we have a lot of medical students now coming to us and I'm trying to get more and more of them into what I'd call wet lab science. So we don't start them on developmental embryological studies in mice, but we do do some translational. So it might be, you know, learn how to section and do some immunostaining of some tissues or do some ELISAs. And, and we always partner the clinicians at post or undergraduate coming into the lab with, with basic scientists to train them. And the model we're doing is sort of over two or three years of some part-time um, commitments. You know, we, we, we build some skills, we see if you're interested, and then we start to talk about, okay, let's now have a dedicated period of time. Um, the one clinician in that photo I showed, a young man called Aaron Long. Aaron took a full year off between his final year and his internship, discovered those stem cells for us in human tissues and got the top honours mark at, at the Uni of Adelaide. So, you know, it, it can be done. Um, for real basic science, you do need to, you need to dedicate the time to learn and to, and to, you know, trial and error and make mistakes and learn from them but you can definitely, definitely get exposure in, in sort of a part-time capacity. Okay, I think at this point, I'm gonna ask you all to thank these four fantastic, oh yes, sorry, do you? <laughs> I thought you were saying hurry up. <laughs> no, 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 I have a question. Um, so my question is the, so I mean, we've all been given very enthusiastic talks about why you do it. But along your time, I'm sure there have been people to, who've told you not to do it. And, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons we don't see some clinician scientists continue, because someone says to them, get the $9 million yacht and, you know, do this and do that. Don't bother, you know, doing the, um, the science and the research. Have people said that to you and, and how did you overcome that, that negativity? So cardiologists don't earn $9 million in seven years, but I, I was told along the way, you've just cost yourself $2 million. <laughs> um, it was personal drive, Steve. There's a little bit of, I want to prove people wrong, particularly with the project I did as a PhD. Um, I had all sorts of doubts, you know, this is just too risky. And so, you know, you, you embark on a journey and that inner drive makes you want to just see it through. And then you realise you're having fun and, Maybe along the way you're finding something that's going to lead to something new um, and it becomes more enticing. But there, I think there are different reasons along different parts of the journey. I think I would be lying if I said I didn't have doubts as to, you know, one of my mentors said, hey, Pete, you can always, you know, stop and put up a sign somewhere in Victor Harbour and open up a cardiology clinic. And maybe at the back of the mind, I also always know that I've got that as a default. Um, but... Um, I come back to the diversity, Steve. You know, I gave my dad's example. 50 years, five days a week. I struggle doing it one day a week. I love it, but it exhausts me being in the clinic. So having that mixture, it, for me, is the perfect tonic for my personality. Um, maybe just two comments. Um, one is, I think when you really enjoy something, um, you want to keep doing it. And I can't think of anyone that sort of put me off doing what I was doing. My husband, who Peter knows, says to me all the time, why are you so happy? You come home from work and you're always happy, you know. <laughs> so there's, there's something about what you're doing, the diversity, the interests, the people you're meeting, the, you know, the new relationships you're forming in, in your work is um, so much fun. Um, and I do see um, my, the people I went through, colleagues that went through medicine, and um, those that have, well, many of those who've chosen to work in one very specific area, and it's actually often surgeons, are now actually pretty bored with what they're doing. They're doing the same operations over and over and over again. And, um, and I think that is a bit of a risk. I think if, you can, if everyone can add in a bit of research, it's gonna keep you really stimulated and interested in what you're doing. If you really love what you do and if you're finding the passion and the drive, you're not going to hear the no. And I think um, that's certainly been a big thing for me. I just don't hear, no, you can't do this. Um, you find ways around it and, um, you know, maybe that's that's crazy. But, but it does, you can, with persistence, you can eventually get there. Uh, I think that, um, uh, that people who are telling you don't do this, Think very carefully about where they are and um, you know and, and and why they're telling you that, uh, and then try and ignore their advice because if you want to do it, just do it. There you go. Great way to finish the session. Could you please?
Okay, sorry, we've got one question at the end. Go ahead. I'll wait for your microphone. No, I can't hear you. Wait. <laughs> it's almost there. Sorry for that. Final, final question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So uh, as a clinical scientist, or maybe a clinician slash scientist, so how important do you think is winning a grant or a fund to fund your project uh, to kind of fuel your passion? Say you don't have funds, will you still be passionate about pursuing that research or would you still focus on clinics? Um, so I, I talked about you know the smell of an oily rag model um, that we have um, in our group. Um, you do need some funding uh, because you can't do it all and at some point you will have to have, um, you'll need money for people. Uh, most of my research, uh, the dollars go into supporting people to do the projects and to do the work and you will need funding um, for these guys for consumables and, um, and actually direct research costs. So you can't get away without any research, uh, without any research funding, but you can do a lot with very little if you're clever about it and if you leverage the environment and the infrastructure that you're in. It just depends on, on what you want to do. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't tell you guys this, but as clinicians with paid work, you're actually worth about 500,000 to a scientific program because you already have a job. Scientist has to get a grant for every single salary. Secondly, the clinical acumen, the things you'll learn along the way, um, and I think the Stanford did a study of passion scores of undergrads and they worked out high passion drastically over, over Trump's um, academic importance. Because a passionate person will stick to the same thing over a 20 year period and that's worth, that's worth a million dollars. So you don't need grants first. What's far more important is to think about what questions are worth actually answering and then slowly team up with people that are thinking the same way and the money will follow. Yep, final comment. Jade, last comment, fellowships. Um, one of the challenges in my field is that these people go off and they brilliantly train clinically and they just can't get jobs where they want to get jobs. Um, and so I start having conversations with my medical students who are coming into our program. Thinking, how are we going to position you to get a Heart Foundation or an NHMRC fellowship when you are ready to come back so that the university, you know, the universities are going to want you, you're going to have protected time. So the fact that you're all in this room tells me that you're motivated to be thinking ahead. You need to think a few years ahead to support yourselves when you come back. You know, make yourselves incredibly attractive to the universities by bringing in fellowship funding as well as grants. Okay, now could you please thank uh, Fred Cookies. <laughs>